humor. I, I, the scripture today is a familiar word, I'm going to guess. You've probably heard it once or twice. And it's part of Luke's uh, chapter 15. I'm going to read from uh, Gene Peterson's The Message. So hear these words, if you will. The only problem with this Bible is the print is. <laughs> so the words that you see on the screen won't be exact. So I invite you perhaps, and my prayer is that these are familiar words, as I said, um, that you'll hear these with perhaps fresh and, and new ears. And then he said, there was once a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. And some fathers would have said, I'll, I'll give you what's, no, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> So the father divided the property between them. And it wasn't long before the younger son packed up his bags and left for a distant country. There, undisciplined, dissipated, he, he wasted everything he had. And after he had gone through all his money, there was a bad famine all through that country, and he began to hurt. He signed on with a citizen who assigned him to his fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry he would have eaten the corn cobs and the pig slop, but no one would give him any. That brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working for my father sit down for three meals a day, and I'm starving to death. I'm going back to my father. And I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against God, and I've sinned against you. We'll get this here piece right. I don't be, deserve to, call, to be called your son, so take me on as a hired hand. And he got right up and went home to his father. And when he was still a long way off. I love that phrasing. His father saw him. His heart pounding, he ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. The son started his speech, Father, I've sinned against God and sinned against you. I don't deserve to be called your son again. Can you imagine how many times this kid rehearsed that speech? But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to his servants, quick, Bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. And then a grain-fed heifer and roast it. We're going to have a feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here. Given up for dead and is now alive. Given up for lost and is now fine, found. <clears throat> and they began to have a wonderful time. All this time... The oldest son was out in the field. When the day's work was done, he came in, and as he approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. Calling over to one of the other servants, he asked what was going on, and he told him, your brother came home. Your father has ordered a feast, barbecued beef, because he has him home safe and sound. The older brother stalked off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. Then the son said, look how many years I stayed with you, serving you, never giving you one moment of grief, but you've thrown a party for, have you ever thrown a party for me and my friends? Then the son of yours who was thrown away, who has thrown away your money and shows up and goes out and you have a feast. His father said, son, you don't understand. You were with me all the time. Everything I have, everything that's mine is yours. But this is a wonderful time and we have to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead. He's now alive. He's lost and he is now found. 
May God bless this reading and our hearing of this word. Would you pray with me? Ever living and ever loving God, we do give you thanks for this time together, for this time of worship and praise and We pray, O oh God, that in these moments, you would open not just our ears, but our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I said earlier, for like home, are we still on? We're still okay, okay. And, and what I'd like to focus on is this idea of home. And certainly in the past year, we have redefined home, haven't we? What's, what's home been for you in this past year? Anybody? Home. For some, it feels, quite frank, um, almost like a prison. Those four walls start talking to you after a while. For some, it's an office. For some, it's a workplace. For some, it's a school and a recreation center. For, for others and, and for some that, we, that join us live stream, it's a place of worship. In the church that my wife and I attend, quite frankly, while, while they were live streaming the service and the churches were closed, we kind of got used to, you know, you get up, have a little something to eat, get your coffee, sit in the recliner, and go to church. When the church opened up, we teased our minister and said, oh, can we bring our recliner in, please, and just kind of <laughs> put it in there? We lost that battle. Since I retired from um, the United Methodist Church, local church ministry, I've been working as a hospice chaplain. In hospice, um, families of, and have chosen. We're going we're to do this. Okay. We'll try this. Is that is that better? Okay. I have to hope I can juggle a mic and notes and everything else. Anyway, as, as in, in my work as a hospice chaplain, for some families, folks have chosen to keep loved ones at home and care for them in their last days, knowing full well that if they were to go to a facility, the day they would enter would be the last time they would see him alive. And that's a tough place for folks to be. Some of you may well know that. Luke 15, a wonderful chapter in Luke's gospel. I just shared with you a passage that we commonly call prodigal son. Thank you. But it's part of, it's the end of three stories in, in Luke 15. And Luke 15 sometimes has been called the lost and found chapter of Luke's gospel. Because in the beginning of that chapter, you have the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And some folks have called this story that we call the prodigal son, the story of the lost son. And the passage that... that strikes me, and I don't know what word or phrase struck you in, in the reading of that, but the passage that strikes me in that is that phrase where, where this kid is off in Netherland, and while a far way off, one translation says that he longs for home. Now, according to, and this is 
pandemic. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, on average, 43 million Americans move every year. That's about 16% of the population who are hitting the road, packing boxes every year. The typical American now is expected to move more than 14 times in their lifetime. And I thought we moved a lot as Methodist clergy. For a while, at one point, we lived in Northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. And it was an unusual military families every two years. You don't even get the boxes unpacked and you're packing them up again. So, raises the question, why is it so many of us are constantly moving from one place to another? Now, the common answer to that is, of course, work, and it's true. And, and what we're seeing now, as we're hopefully coming out of this pandemic, is folks that moved out of cities to, because they're working from home, move to places where they could be more comfortable and not be in apartments like in New York City or elsewhere. They're moving back. And as I said, the most common answer is work, but, but could it be, is it possible that there's something deeper to that? So the question I, I ask is, what do you call home? And I'm asking more than just your mailing address. Some would say that at the, at the core of that question is, is really a spiritual question and a yearning in the soul. And some would say that in fact, Part of being human is a searching for a place called home inside. Craig Barnes is now president of Princeton Theological Seminary. Some years ago, he wrote a book entitled Searching for Home. And in there he writes, the real home for which we yearn isn't a place where we grew up or a new place that we're hoping to build, but a place where, where we were created to live. We weren't created to, to roam the earth lost and confused. We were created to live at home with God, which some folks call paradise. Whether we want to admit it or not, the longing for home is a welling up deep within our souls. This may even be part of God's searching for us. At the core of some of the most beloved passages in Scripture is this yearning and longing for home. Adam and Eve long for paradise and what happens to them after that famous apple incident. They get kicked out of the house. Abraham leaves home to find the promised land. The exiled Hebrews yearned to return home when they were exiled into Babylon. And this lovely second son, the prodigal son, who comes to his senses, travels home. The entire biblical experience is a story of folks yearning and roaming and longing for home. Dante's Inferno begins with words which express this longing. Midway along the journey of life, I woke to find myself in a dark wood, for I'd wandered off the straight path. And then he continues, how I entered, I cannot truly say, 
I had become so sleepy at the moment when I first strayed, leaving the path. One of the things that happened to this son, that happened to Dante, was this feeling when he strayed long from home of being lost and alone. Some years ago, one of my seminary professors told me that the number one need that we meet in the church is loneliness. There was an article in, in The Atlantic some time ago that, that asked this question. Is Facebook making us lonely? And talked about how this loneliness has an effect on us mentally and I would suggest spiritually. It cites that, in this article, they cite that 20% of Americans are unhappy with their lives because they feel lonely. And there's a difference between being alone and feeling lonely. And it's interesting to note that, that in this article, they cite another study that, that said that those that believe in God those who see God as, as a helpful companion along life's journey are far less lonely. And at the core of our faith is belief in a God who walks with us, journeys with us, sometimes holds our hands and sometimes gives us a but nonetheless is with us along the way. The theologian Barbara Brown Taylor once said, God does some of God's best work with those who feel lost and alone. So if we're honest with ourselves, what, what we find in in trying to understand what home is, it isn't a place. It's not where you send, get your Christmas cards. But it's a connection. It's a connection with others. In John's Gospel, Jesus uses the imagery of calling his disciples friends and uses the imagery of a vine and the branches to, to describe that kind of connection with God and being together with God and that companion along the way. And, and, and as I said, defines his disciples, calls his disciples friends. And this isn't the kind of friends that you push a button and get a link on Facebook. I won't go into that one. But the kind of friends who companion, walk with one another, be with one another. And in, in later in, in the Bible, in John's letter, he talks about how being with God, we are God's, we are adopted as children and, and, and welcomed into home. And when I think of that, I, I quite frankly, I'm, I'm reminded of, of a funeral I had some years ago of, of a gentleman that um, quite frankly passed away far too young. He was my age. Um, and he left three children. They were a soccer family. So every weekend they were on some soccer field somewhere. 
And one, one of the children was uh, Colombian, and, and they adopted this Colombian child. And this young man came to me just before the service, and he said, Pastor Bob, he said, can I, can I speak? Which, of course you can speak. But to be honest with you, it makes any preacher a little bit nervous. And the young man got up and talked about his dad and, and the wonderful relationship we had. But the thing that struck with me and still sticks with me, he said, you know, he said, folks, you know I'm adopted, and you could tell. And he said, what? He said, my folks could have adopted any child in the world, but they chose me. They chose me, and they loved me, and they walked with me, and there were times that I could be a real, you'll fill in the blank, stinker, shall we say, and they loved me still. I think about that when, when the letter of John talks about being an adopted child of God that we all are. That God chooses us, walks with us. Sometimes when we're real stinkers. And loves us still. When we come to discover that truth then it's, isn't it exactly what Luke's gospel talked about? We come to our senses in some way. We come to know the one who is with us through this journey we call life. The one who loves us like none other. The one who would never abandon us and welcomes us with open arms. And in that rests all our hope all our faith. The poet T.S. Eliot put it this way. We shall not cease from exploration, he writes, and at the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know that place for the first time. Will you pray with me? Ever-loving God, we do give you thanks for your incredible love for us. That we rest and live always with you in that place that we call home, your loving arms. Bless us this day and always, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What was that? My memory is gone. That that song, "Good Good Father." Um, I was reminded, quite frankly, of maybe you have seen the uh, clip on the news of this teacher. I think in Atlanta, Georgia, she holds the mirror up for the kids. And at the top, I am. And I thought, as we're singing, what if, what if we were to go home or sometime today or even tomorrow morning when you get up or brush your teeth or whatever, and were to say, by God, I am loved by God. Just think how that would start your day. Or at night. Thank you for the, of being here today. Uh, for joining us and, and worshiping and celebrating together. And my hope and prayer is that the blessing of Almighty God the one who created you, 
who redeems you, who sustains you, who walks by you and never lets go. We'll be with you this day and always. Amen.